uh, friends and colleagues, uh, we know that we've only just begun to learn about Coast Salish and other Indigenous traditions. We've only just started to understand the importance of rites of passage, medicine bundles, and longhouses. And I'm so thrilled and comforted to know that we have caring and committed Indigenous partners who are willing to walk this path with us, uh, because we don't always get it right. Uh, so enough for me, I want to introduce Rocky James and Elders, Florence James and Dr. Lee Brown, who will talk to us about their work and the importance of building a two-spirit longhouse. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see everyone. I couldn't tell if I was nervous or excited, but once I got up here and I seen everybody's faces, I was like, no, this feels really good that everybody cares enough to come here today and make a positive difference um, for our health care. Since 2011, I have been working on creating space for two-spirit well-being in the CBRC community. From the knowledge as a Coast Salish two-spirit person, that if done well, Indigenous well-being and human development is continuous across the lifespan. We grow into the awareness that Indigenous and Two-Spirit people assert a sovereign right for holistic health services. In the words of Seamus O'Regan at the 2019 Indigenomics Conference, the best solutions are local ones. Through the, C, uh, through the CBRC Two-Spirit, people may begin to operate through the health parable of the um, River of Health. Um, so the river of health is a woman is walking by a river. She sees a baby struggling, floating by, drowning, and she jumps in to save it. She gets the baby to shore, and she notices another baby is going by. So she goes in, saves the baby, brings it to shore. But then she notices another baby going by, and another one, and another one, and another one, and she can't keep up with it. Um, <clears throat> so then she begins to ask herself, where are all these babies coming from? Who's putting these babies and who's throwing these babies into a river? Um, so that gives us an opportunity to move into a more indigenous perspective of healthcare, service design, program design, service delivery, evaluation. So really, any, I'm, I'm a, as a policy analyst, I love policy, <laughs> and the way I've been taught by my mother and grandmothers is that the foundation of my research and my life begins with me asking myself three questions across my lifespan. Who am I? Where do I come from? What is my purpose? and having stuck with that since uh, college, I've learned to realize how that changes over time, how I see indigenous people changes over time, how I see the relationship between indigenous and non-indigenous people changes over time, if I stick to those three questions. So, part of oral history is going back and constantly reviewing oral history. And what we introduced through the CBRC is the two-spirit rites of passage two years ago. And we need to continuously revisit that for different lessons for where we are today. Where we are today is different from where we were two years ago. The Indigenous Rites of Passage is an anti-racist and anti-queerphobia act. We are not only our sickness. Since 2011, I've been working through a politics of recognition lens, which means often by the misrecognition of others, a person or a group of people can suffer real damage. Real distortion, if the people or society around them mirror back to them a confining or demeaning or contemptible picture of themselves. Non-recognition or misrecognition can inflict harm, can be a form of oppression, 
imprisoning one in a false, distorted, and reduced mode of being. Cultural and human genocide in Canada has resulted in the displacement of non and non-recognition of two-spirit people. The rites of passage ceremony pushes back against that worldview while inviting non-Indigenous people into the practice. So again, why keep revisiting the rites of passage ceremony? To reconcile Indigenous and non-Indigenous worldviews on research, policy, and practice. Cultural continuity is the means we will communicate with each other. In 2020, the CBRC will participate in an anglicized version of a potlatch, gifting two-spirit people with a medicine bundle. I would like to introduce the first ever Two-Spirit Lawnhouse. At the 2018 summit, our elder Florence James, Theos, gifted us with a Coast Salish word for two-spirit people. That word is huash suck. It is a biopsychosocial word that spiritually and physically connects two-spirit people to the land. In 2017, we introduced the 94 TRC calls to action, and in 2018, we revisited the TRC calls to action and introduced the concept of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, or as some people refer to it as UNDRIP. Through the CBRC, we operate through non-Indigenous worldviews. As such, to really grasp what the TRC calls to action and UNDRIP mean to Indigenous people, especially to spirit people, we use the rites of passage ceremony as a means of conveying that message. This is, um, this is one way that indigenous human development unfolds in indigenous families. Nested within the ceremony are many fine details about human development across the lifespan. When we design research, when we design intervention, when we design outcome evaluation tools, we need to ask ourselves, what do people want to achieve? What capabilities are we providing people to help them make those achievements? What is actually being achieved? And finally, what is the politics of the gap? Meaning, what is the difference between what people want to achieve and what they have actually achieved as a result of our intervention. Indigenous culture is the intervention. Indigenous culture is governance. Indigenous culture is policy. The intersection between research, policy, and practice. The CBRC are now Lawnhouse people. That means you. How are we going to run our lawn house? Haitsepka. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lee Brown. <clears throat> I'm a Cherokee person. I was born for the Wolf Clan. We have seven clans. I'm from the Wolf Clan, and my name in the Cherokee language is Saint Nusti, someone that brings a message. It can also mean someone that brings a message through dreams. It can also mean someone that brings a message by singing. And last night, uh, I did have a dream. I was in a place where I didn't know what was going on. I think this is it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wasn't sure what was happening. <laughs> but I had my drum with me and I brought my drum today. There are days that I just walk with my drum. And I wasn't really sure. I had a different vision of what I was doing this morning. I thought I was using this smudge and doing a buzzing circle. And, but this is something else. So as a, I, I want to share with you that 
First thing I want to share with you is I want to thank each and every one of you for being the kind of people that want to be involved in the healing of other human beings. Thank you for that. My life has been a health struggle. I was born into an alcoholic home and an alcoholic community. And when I was going to seventh grade, I began limping. And I wasn't sure why I was limping, but I knew something wasn't right. At that time, I was in the downward spiral of alcoholic malnutrition. Not no food, but no good food. At that time, I was eating government commodities. We had so many packages and tin cans in our house that said United States government, not for resale. I thought it was a brand name. Okay, that was a joke. Like, if, <laughs> if, if tougher, I mean, it's good out of the wall. The, uh, when it came time to go back to school in eighth grade, I didn't go. I was laying in the back room of our house. I had lost the ability to walk from malnutrition and the illnesses of malnutrition. Rheumatic fever, light scarlet fever, internal heart infection, kidney infection. I was in bad shape. I laid there for over a year. My weight was going down. My body was swelling up. I was losing my teeth. My teeth were breaking off at the gums and abscesses began to grow up out of the roots of my teeth and I didn't know what to do. So I took an old Gillette blue blade razor and broke it in half and cut the abscesses out of my mouth with a razor blade until I could, this, that's the worst fact of the day. So <laughs> yeah, so I could get to a doctor and have the roots removed. And I didn't get a dental surgeon. I got a guy with a corkscrew and you can't deaden a root. That was a very bad day for me. My hair was falling out, <clears throat> and I had a moment of clarity at age 12, like I've never had any other time in my life. A moment of absolute clarity. The room began to shine, and I said to myself, I'm going to die in this room. My life as a human being is coming to an end. People aren't paying attention to me, and I'm getting worse. And several months later, I made the journey. I took this body off like you'd take off a coat. It made a long journey. It'd take a long time for me to tell you about all of it, but I'll tell you one thing I learned on my journey. I learned this. In this world, kindness is an important thing. Having a PhD, nice. If you're at UBC, good thing. Not that important, <laughs> you know? Small, unnoticed things are the important things of this world. And when I came back to myself, which was like this. <gasps> oh no, I'm back in this body. I'm going to live. I came back with one thought. What would it take to be a healthy human being? What would it take for my family to be healthy? What would it take for my nation, the Cherokee Nation, to be healthy? What would it take for all the human beings to be healthy? Because you know, we're getting sicker. We have an incredible health care system, but incidences of illness are increasing you know, in our communities. I've talked to a lot of medical conventions. I was a keynote speaker for the World Association of German Psychiatrists one time. That's an interesting group. <laughs> you know, I gave a talk to the board of directors of Vancouver uh, Health. VGH hospital, and many times I said in my life, you know, the elders tell us, our elders, my grandparents and other elders I learned from told me that a long time ago, Native people had no major illness as we have it now. We had illnesses, but we could actually cure them. And I, and I was retired from UBC. I've been retired about five years now. I'm in my 70s, or as I like to say, going on 80. And uh, I... Realized after I retired, and I was thinking about one day, of all the doctors groups I ever spoke to and of all the health professionals I ever spoke to, no one ever asked me, how did they do it? How did Native people have that level of health that when illness came here, it hit us so hard? We didn't have illness as we have it now. And um, <clears throat> I thought, well, maybe they just didn't believe me, or maybe they weren't interested. But anyway, 
When I came back to myself, I was able to return to school eventually. Government found out about my situation. I started getting medication. I took 500,000 units of Pilocin a day for 14 years. Trice my immune system. 500,000 units of Pilocin a day for 14 years to regain my health. And uh, as a teenager looking around wanting health, what I found to help, help myself Doctors said I wouldn't probably live to be 20, or I lived to be 20. They said you might not make it to 30, and now I'm more than twice that. What I found to help myself as a teenager was the drum. I came to believe if I could become a singer within the context of my culture, the Southern Plains drum, uh, you know, the powwow drum, I could heal myself. <clears throat> it would help me. And I approached some of the elders, and you know, in the 1940s and 1950s in all of North America, there were not that many singers. Singing almost died. I mean, a lot of the stuff was lost. There was a time when uh, you could go to some native communities, there would not be one singer there. Now, almost everybody's heard native singing. It's, it's on the radio, it's on the TV, it's amazing. And uh, <clears throat> I petitioned the elders to, see, to become a singer and I walked out to the drum and it was, uh, was really shaking, just like I'm kind of shaking now, I guess, and I extended some tobacco, and one of the elders looked at me, and he, he reached up and took the tobacco, and said, I said, I'd like to become a singer. And he said these words, we'll consider your request. <laughs> he said, Lee, we'll let you know. We'll talk about this. And in the discussions, one elder woman said, why teach him to sing? The day's going to come where there won't be a single native singer in this land. He'll be singing by himself. Why teach him? And, uh, but I became a singer, began to feel the healing vibration of the drum upon myself. The kinds of drums that are in the longhouses that Rocky was mentioning, the kind of the, the families that have maintained the ability to sing have suffered greatly to maintain the culture. We owe, we owe them a great debt. So my, my academic life has been a struggle and sometimes I think we've came a long ways and sometimes I hear the exact same conversations I heard 50 years ago trying to justify native culture, native space and basically there's three things that we, we need. We need indigenous space which is hard to create within institutions, true indigenous space like a longhouse. We need a place where indigenous knowledge, the true knowledge can come forth and sometimes that's the people that have the the knowledge is not quite true, make that very difficult to do. And the third thing is to create that space where indigenous voice can be heard. The voices of the elders, the voices of the indigenous people that have something to say about the health and well-being. I think we have a lot to offer uh, humanity in the terms of health. And the, so I want to share two fundamental principles of, of 10 or 12 that I share sometimes about what I've learned from the elders, my grandparents and other elders, about health. And some of this I learned from my grandmother who lived to be 105 and was still carrying her purse and bathing herself at 105 years of age. And one of the things she said is that illness is always a teaching. We should never fight illness Illnesses are blessings that come to teach us something, to return us to balance, and we are way out of balance upon this earth. We are way out of balance. Uh, we're so out of balance that our existence is threatening. You know, one of the things that helps us get back to balance is illness. Illnesses should be appreciated and, and uh, should be, this. I know, that, I know in the current medical way of thinking, this probably sound like I'm crazy, but illnesses are, are, are teachers. And the second thing I'll share with you is that every illness, my grandmother said, goes to a blockage somewhere. The blockage in the mind, a blockage in the heart, blockage in the body, or a blockage in the spirit. And that's the purpose of our culture and our traditions and our ceremonies and our longhouses. If, if I got a major illness, and I did, I'm a cancer survivor. So I went through chemotherapy, but I also went to the elders. I also went through ceremonies. I also went through UEPs and other kinds of ceremonies. 
that's where you find the teaching of the illness. You know, that's where you find the teaching of the illness. When I was a cancer patient, and they said that I could get counseling at the cancer clinic over here on 10th, and so I went to a counselor and I said, I want to talk about what I went through as a child and, you know, and the things I went through. Oh, she says, you can't talk about that. And as soon as I said that I was native, she pulled a little paper out of her place. Oh, native, you can go to these native counselors. I said, I can't go to them. They, they were my students. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want them to know my heavy stuff. <laughs> and before I quit, I want to say, well, that was you, Harlan, in the movie, right? Was that you? Yeah. I couldn't quite tell from that angle, but Harlan said something about race. Here's what I taught my children about race. Race is a box that limits our potential as human beings. Culture is a horizon with infinite potential. Never let anybody put you in the race box. We are cultural human beings. Cultures occur in longhouses. They occur in ceremony. You know, we have to see ourselves as cultural people, not racial people. Forget race. Don't let anybody do that to you. You know, we're, we, that's a false concept. False concepts cause sickness. Don't let people do that to you. We're cultural beings. I'm a stomp dancer, you know, originally. And I want to, <clears throat> do I have a couple more minutes? Or should I, I was dreaming last night about bringing the drum and I thought I was going to sing here today. So I think I'll share a little song from Oklahoma with you. My aunt is a Sac and Fox from the Sac and Fox tribes. She's Sac and Fox and one quarter Cherokee and three quarter Sac and Fox. But she's not really my aunt, she's actually my cousin. But her and her husband are much older than me, so they call me nephew. I'll sing a song from over her way, Sac and Fox song. myself and heal myself with and I really appreciate health I'm happy for I appreciate every day of life that I have a day of life is a great thing we have this day together and again I just want to close by thanking you and hoping that we could put our minds and our hearts together to make health for the generations to come all my relations Thank you, Dr. Brown. Thank you for that.
Now I want to introduce uh, Elder Florence James and Rocky's mom. Hi, Nathan. Good morning. So I'm going to do my protocol because I'm in a very special area of the land, so I'll do it in Coast Salish dialect. Hi, Chati Tilsiam at Tanaquail, Tihumi Tewatal, Kotanaquail, eat mugs quails, Unisal Tanawat Lim Tal Kotish Tates, Tuima Tal Kotanaquail. I'll translate that for you. Dear Creator, thank you here on this day. Please help us today in all our days. We ask for a special leading and guidance as I speak with you about the way that my mom spoke to me. So thanking the sacredness of the land here, providing us a place to stand, and uh, it's just next door over here to Stanley Park. So welcoming you all to stand in a sacred way. I had a very... Uh, Mom that experienced residential school for seven years in our culture in the big house there. My family grew in that big house and they used all the virtues, values, and rituals that enriched your life as you grew up in it. And they did follow those virtues to the day till they passed on to the spirit world. So my great-grandfather who ran it, he lived to 113, and he never did get sick. He fell, and he had an injury, and they couldn't uh, repair it, so he passed on. So he wasn't sick. I wish that for myself as I experience the different uh, things that are happening to my body. But we have, were living in a good time when we could go to a health place and ask for help or just someone to talk to. So I feel there's a change that's really good. And there's a young lady sitting here. She'll probably have her turn talking to you at some point. But we're, I lift my hands in honor. And thanks to all of you that work in the health field. As you know, the mind, the cities, is uh, something that can combat everything that you do. If you're thinking something not good about yourself, it can hurt you. So our own minds can do some damage. So my great-grandfathers who lived in those big houses, they had on that big house that you're looking at uh, figures, spiritual figures that were there meant to help you, not hurt you. So in our times, we had a time when the government banned the uh, uh, Coast Salish ways, which did harm to, it was more of a banking place where you did reciprocity and a lot of praying. So to me, I feel like they were the first Christians on earth that, that were told things through their hearts, not their minds. And they shared it with us, so it helped us to build a stronger way of thinking for ourselves. So they actually could say to you, you could heal yourself. I had a niece, she was murdered. We have a small little place to live. It was private, quiet. And my niece was murdered by her boyfriend. And it told me, like how Dr. Brown explained to you, 
there are some things not right here. So if you have that happen in your village, there's something right not going on there. So that made me think more on the ways of the health field. It made me remember what my mom said. I was scolded of the way that I needed to speak to my son as a two-spirited person. And every word I thought I was speaking okay, she said, no, you're not. You need to speak to him better than that. She wanted to me to speak in a classy way to my son so that he could develop what he needed to, to have for himself in a way of feeling good about who he is. So I really needed you to hear that. My mom was just right on me, like everything that I said about my son. No, you need not to be saying that, she said. You need to say it this way, a special way how to speak to my son. So anyone that would experience their life, the way they're going to develop is the way they want to develop their life. Not you telling him how to be. So I got corrected right away. So you had to shoot. I wished you could have known my mom. And so there's a special way that you say things to what you name, and I don't like to use labels, but you need to teach me on it. But I'm going to share the virtues the way that she told me how to share love came first. So the way I had to speak was with love. And no other way was it accepted by her until I spoke properly. So proper meaning, watch what you say and how you say it. It can cause injury to the heart where you need all the love and care. The tenderness is what she was correcting me on. So from there, that's the old, old ways, the way they raised my family in the big house. That's what she wanted me to do because she was there with my dad. As a little boy, that's where he was raised. So remember now, this is not the way your family spoke. They spoke a certain way to people to help them to believe in themselves to have a dream. So to share with you, how do we do that? How do we do a dream? How do we make that a reality? To be who you are, to dream for what you need for yourself, to be feeling good about it. So just a small example, the other day I was called to uh, speak to the Baha'i faith, Esther, uh, reconciling with the First Nation people. So I was wishing for a piece of fish. So I thought, I haven't had a fish for, so I dreamed it into a reality. So guess what I got there? And they served me fish. <laughs> so there was my fish. So that's how you dream. I'll leave you my secret. <laughs> <laughs> Dream it into reality. You know the secret, do you? So use that secret. It's a special way. The last thing I'm going to leave for you is the word Hwatsak. They kept asking me, what is the word for two-spirit? That doesn't necessarily mean two-spirit but what becomes of you. So you're looking at the picture there, and in the nature was the only way that I could share with my son. There's a beauty about the light that comes from you. And when you are 
gather in your light and you're gathering your energy in the English way of speaking inside of you. For that light to come about, you need certain things from the earth. So over there, if you're looking at that beautiful picture, all the stars, all the moon, all the sun, and meets the earth and produces the light, which is the energy you need for your life to sustain you. It's from the earth. So inside of you, that's developing, but you're going to have a pain for it to come about. As it comes together inside of you, that light is forming, but you will also have pain. So no gain without pain. <laughs> so for your light to come about inside of you, you have to know there's a bit of work to it. Okay? So to help you, that was the only thing I could think of to tell my son. When I spoke to my mom, they didn't talk about it in my community. I had one uncle. I knew he wasn't who he seemed to be, but I didn't ask about it. They didn't talk about it. In the village, they just said, that's your uncle, and I'm not to question it, but I knew he wasn't the same as us. But they didn't label him, and uh, sometimes he went through ridicule, but he was so happy when, when he was amongst the families. But I know he did have pain about who he was, so it reminded me of, of the, that pain that I'm talking to you about. So just remember the light that you're developing. It's a very special one. And I want you to hold that dear to your heart. I'm going to send to you for who, just about who you are. And I'm going to send it in a language. And I'll translate it because I send it to the students. Because I don't know what's personal. I'm just concerned about how they are. Hi, you Sacred, you are sacred, you are sacred, so sacred. And I wish I could hug each one of you, okay? <laughs> So just put this on to your heart for love and comfort from me. Hi, Chika. Hi, Chika. Florence and Rocky will actually be uh, with us for the duration of the summit, so please come say hi and collect your hugs. Uh, thank you to everyone, Dr. Brown, Florence, Rocky, and Glenn. Uh, Glenn's now going to introduce Dr. James McCocus. Thank you, everyone.